It has been in existence since the last uh, seven to eight years in India. Uh, let's see what silent endoscopy is all about. Now, I have one question to the audience. Should I be focusing more on the basics of silent endoscopy or uh, the enlarged aspect of it? Okay. So, uh, what exactly is silent endoscopy? Silent endoscopy is uh, examination of the ductal system of the salivary gland using a miniature endoscope and it is passed through the natural opening of the duct. Now, all of us, we have been through learning new techniques all throughout our life and we have, we have to go through all of these. So, let us not be afraid of uh, venturing into a new field. All of us will have to climb these steps and then finally, we will reach this step. Now, if you look at the scenario, uh, in Europe it has been practiced for the last two decades, but in India it is seven or eight years old and I have an experience of 237 cases by uh, today and uh, that is entirely in private practice. I have also had the pleasure to publish two chapters in this book, which is the first book on hands-on on silent endoscopy, uh, published by Professor Francis Marshall from Geneva. Now, let us look at the instruments. <clears throat> if you look at it, there are two types of scopes. This is called a modular scope. So, you can see this is actually a fiber optic scope. The terminal 16 centimeters are steel encased. So, it is a semi rigid kind of a scope, but it still contains fibers and no rod lens. It comes with different sheets which will have, a, this is a diagnostic sheet and these two are therapeutic sheets which also have an instrument channel. The other type of scope is, this is called an all-in-one scope which has all the three things, the irrigation channel, the instrument channel and the fiber optics all built into one. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. The all-in-one is easier to introduce, but if you want to use a larger instrument channel, you have to change an entire scope which means it is an another outlay of say around 3 to 4 lakh rupees. But if you use this scope, the modular one, you can change just the sheet and you can get a bigger instrument channel to pass a broader instrument like maybe a forceps. Now, this is the setup at my hospital. A routine endoscopy setup is good enough and all of us are fortunate enough to have a microscope and we should be using a microscope along with an endoscope for this. Uh, Symptoms and signs most of us know or these are all about obstructive salivary gland disorders. So, there will be recurrent swelling of the salivary glands generally associated with food intake especially sour foods. There can be foul smelling discharge into the uh, mouth, it could be pus discharge and if you examine clinically you will find a hypertrophic gland especially the parotid with a bosselated surface. What I have always found is important is the duct will be tender. If you clench the teeth the masseter comes into prominence and over the anterior border of the masseter you can feel that parotid duct. It is just parallel to the zygoma a finger breadth below it. So, that is very important. Now, what are the indications for sial endoscopy? You will find that the intraductal obstructions, like there is something obstructing the flow of saliva and most of the times it is sialolithiasis and stones can come in various shapes and sizes, but there can also be foreign bodies and they can be inanimate or animate. What about the other kind of obstructions? When the ductal lumen narrows down, it is a stricture and strictures are very common in juvenile recurrent parotitis. If you talk to your pediatric colleagues, they will always keep on telling you that I have a, quite a few patients who have recurrent parotitis and I do not know what to do to them. Also, there is a large number of cases of adult recurrent parotitis and mind you, radioiodine and radiation induced siladenitis is on the rise because these modalities are now being used quite frequently. The contraindications are acute siladenitis and it is basically so because silendoscopy is done under water. The normal duct is collapsed. So, you have to stent kind of duct, play it out using saline and then the scope passes through. So, if it is acutely inflamed and pus is draining through, then your visibility is lost. That is the reason why acute silatinitis is a contraindication. But as you grow in the field, sometimes some acute uh, parotitis do not respond to antibiotics. In those cases, you still can do a silatinoscopy and treat the obstruction. 
the current limitations and why do I call these current limitations is because limitations which are existent today need not necessarily be there tomorrow and this is happening in every field. So large siloliths, siloliths which are more than 8 millimeters what do you do about them? So what can be done is something called as a combined approach, it can be an internal or an external combined approach. Intraglandular siloliths is something which is a myth there is no intraglandular siloliths. All siloliths form inside the duct because they are precipitates of calcium present in the saliva. Side strictures is sometimes strictures which you cannot dilate using a sile endoscope. Then you can do an external combined approach and bypass the stricture using a vein. Now if you look at all the salivary gland disorders, you will find 80% a huge chunk of it is obstructive salivary gland disorder. So all these 80% are amenable to sile endoscopy which means there is a huge scope for all of us to venture into this field of sile endoscopy. The incidence in numbers is one stone and one stricture per 20,000 population per annum which turns out to 1.2 lakh cases all over India. And I come from a district called Nashik which has a population of 61 lakhs which means 610 cases annually. Okay, so there's, there's a huge scope, there's a huge potential for this. How do I treat a patient? A patient who's symptomatic comes to my OPD, I will get an ultrasound done. Obviously a clinical examination is part of the first contact but then I will get an ultrasound done. But in ultrasound, I will see a stone or I will not see a stone. If there is a stone, my diagnosis is made. If there is no stone, there are two possibilities. One is the stone has been missed. So your radiologist has to be competent enough to find out a stone, especially in the submandibular, which is closer to the papilla. Also, most of the ultrasound machines, the least they can detect is a stone which is larger than 3 millimeters. So a stone which is less than 3 millimeters can be missed. And the third possibility is that is there is no stone but there is a stricture and a stricture cannot be seen on ultrasound. But the fact that the patient is symptomatic means there is an obstruction. If no stone, generally a stricture. So after this, I would post the patient for sile endoscopy. If my finding is correct, I find a stone, I remove it. If I find a stricture, I dilate and stent it. But there will be a few percentage of cases where the ultrasound and the sile endoscopy there is a discrepancy between the two. Now, if there is a discrepancy, then what I do is then I get an MR silogram done. It gives me a better idea of the uh, ductal tree. It can give me uh, stones which were missed. It can give me stones which were into branches in which I could not go with the silendoscope. Now, what are the investigations that are required? X-rays is out. We do not I do not advise x-rays for stones also but most of the times patient will come with an x-ray. The first line of investigation is ultrasound and let me tell you this point once you start doing it if you keep on sending the ultrasounds to a single or maybe two radiologists you will find the yield result yield becoming better and better. So you need to communicate with your radiologist telling him or her that okay this was the finding that you told me and this was what I found intraoperatively and then the correlation becomes better. Silography, conventional silography, again we don't advise because if the papilla is damaged, then your chance for sile endoscopy is gone or it makes life more difficult for us. If you want, we can do a MR silography and sometimes a CT. Now the anesthesia, uh, the most important thing is, as I said, it's an underwater kind of a scopy. So we don't want saliva to be dried up. So no atropine, no pyrrolate, free of. Vitamin C, some people give vitamin C, a chewable tablet just 15 minutes before the surgery. LA in cooperative patients, which can either be a block, the inferior alveolar nerve block for the submandibular or installation of 4% xylocaine into the duct. But most of the cases are done under GA because we are irrigating and the fluid tends to go down into the mouth. Now uh, the procedure begins with uh, serial dilatation of the papilla. You can see these are, just let me start 
from the beginning. Okay, so you can see that's a conical dilator. This is the right submandibular papilla. You can see progressively larger dilators going in. This is, I mean, a time lapse photography, videography. So very rapid motion. It takes some time, and then that was the scope going in. Now. In order to do silent endoscopy, you have to be very gentle about the papilla. If you take half an hour to enter the into the duct, take that half an hour because entire procedure will dependent will be dependent on this entry. Now, what is uh, what do you do in a diagnostic endoscopy? Is you follow the lumen of the duct, as you can see. There are a lot of tributaries here. Mind you, they are not branches; they are tributaries. They come in and form a bigger. So you can see multiple. I mean, secondary, tertiary, quaternary branches, uh, tributaries out here. The other thing is most of the times you find a stone. Now that green structure there is the guide wire. It is purposefully green so that it gives us the contrast. And there you see the stone. Now, when I first saw this with my own eyes, I mean, doing it for the first time, my reaction was something like this. I was very happy to see the anatomy which I knew existed here, but I had never seen it in my life. Now, what procedures can be done is, if there is a stricture, you dilate the stricture. This is the guide wire, and this is the end result. Uh, how, why uh, stricture dilatation is so beneficial to the patient? Is if you look at this, this is called Poiseuille's law. If you look at the flow, it is directly proportional to the fourth power of the radius, which basically means if we increase the radius, the flow will increase four times. So that is the reason why dilatation is effective. Let us look at this video. You can see we are traveling into a duct. And then the guide wire going in. This is a 0.6 millimeter wide guide wire, so the duct is nearly 0.8 millimeters at this stage. So at this stage, you the contrast of the guide wire guides us into the right direction. Okay, let's see the other video. You can see now we are reaching a point where the duct has narrowed down. This is the stricture. You can see the lumen here was this big. The guide wire goes in, and the scope follows. The green contrast gives us a good idea of where to follow. And then suddenly there is a give way, and you will see uh, we are entering into a. I don't know what the system is playing up. Okay, I have another video of structure further down the line. Let's see. Uh, the other things that we can do is remove a stone using a basket, a dormia basket, which all of us are conceptually familiar with. So this is the scope going in. This is the instrument channel on the top. You will see the basket coming out through that in a closed position, going beyond the stone. Then we deploy the basket, withdraw it. I don't know what's happening with this. Can you help me out? Actually, structures are coming in. <laughs> Electronic structures. Hmm, I think same. Okay. So uh, this is actually what is happening. That's the basket. You can see multiple stones here. That's the basket being deployed. And I am manipulating the basket to trap the stone. You can see the stone being trapped. And then the entire assembly has to be withdrawn out because the channel itself is a millimeter wide, the instrument channel. So a stone which is larger than a millimeter will not come out through the channel. So you can see the entire assembly is being withdrawn out.
stone removal with a forceps, uh, I mean as an easy concept, you see a stone, put in a forceps through the instrument channel, grab it and remove. Now uh, the only difficulty is the forceps is much thicker than the basket. So you require a bigger instrument channel. You can see uh, the crocodile forceps, the two jaws, one here and one up here. And then it's like a lot of video game going on. You are trying to catch your enemy with your forceps. And all the time this is, I mean you have to keep your scope steady so that the image is in the, you are able to see whatever you see here, this white thing is a white out because it gets in touch with the duck ball, the scope tip. So that is the stone being caught and it is got out. Uh, at, at the end of the procedure, especially for a stricture or a paratoceal, we stent and the stent helps us to keep that paratoceal draining and allowing it to collapse. So the, this is a case of paratoceal, so I am putting external pressure, the paratoceal is emptying through the stent. Now what do we do about large stones as I said? There is something called as a combined approach or it is called a silo docoplasty. Uh, this actually is a photograph taken, I am somewhere here. This is somewhere in the Pin Parvati trek uh, near Manali. And what exactly is a silo docoplasty? So uh, we identified a stone. and then we trap it in a basket, we drag it more anteriorly till the time that it comes, this is a submandibular case, so then we dissect the floor of the mouth, we deliver the stone in the basket and then we remove the basket, do a scopy, this is the cut portion of the duct, we go beyond that and now we have passed a stent and then close it. So this is the end result, what has happened is we have removed the obstruction and we have maintained the flow path. So what is the post-operative care that we take, uh, intraoperative and local antibiotics plus steroids especially if you are do dealing with strictures, uh, analgesics, ice fermentation, avoid sour foods because we do not want too much of saliva to be produced post-operatively, head up 30 degrees and discharge on the same day if you have done under local but an overnight stay if general anesthesia is involved. Now uh, quite a lot of times uh, I have come across people who say if there is a stone we just remove the gland. So I say okay that's fine, that's good for the submandibular, what about the parotid? Do you remove the parotid just because there is an obstruction? So I don't think any one of us does that. And uh, in further of their argument they say that once the stone is there the gland is non-functional. So now let us look at that. This is a case where preoperatively you will find this is the stone, you can see this post shadow effect on ultrasound, you can see changed echogenicity of the gland, this is post operative 15 days, you can see the echogenicity has changed from this to this and now on the post operative day let us compare this gland with the other side and can you find a difference between the two? is the same which means the gland has reverted in its function that's why the echogenicity has gone back to what it was on the normal side. So just because there is a stone does not mean the gland is non-functional. Every gland that is lying in a petri dish is non-functional that I would agree but that is a presumption and that this proves it wrong. The complications which can occur are neural damage to the nerve surrounding, gland removal is a complication but it's very rare. Ranular formation again very rare, stricture can happen if you have injured the mucosa of the duct and degloving of the duct is also seen especially in strictures because you have to force your weight to dilate the stricture so sometimes that can cause. Minor could be bleeding, infection, perforation if you perforate you stop and I have had the case, the chance to do a case the next day that I perforated 
and I could not find the perforation. So, it had healed. So, we know the peritoneum heals in 6 hours. So, probably the floor of mouth structures healed in 24 hours or maybe 48 hours. Swelling due to irrigation and TM joint pain. Now, this is a picture of degloving. If you can see, this is the guide wire. This is gone into this part of this and this entire mucosal cuff has been pushed in. So, the treatment is you get the guide wire out, thread it through here, pass in a stent and leave it at like that. The mucosa grows over the stent and you prevent a stricture. If you look at it, the age distribution, um, a lot of cases, adult uh, juvenile recurrent parotitis. Most of uh, them, I, I have a patient who was waiting 38 years for a non-excisional treatment to his stone in the parotid. Uh, the strictures in the stone follow the book pattern of 80 percent stones in the submandibular, 80 percent strictures in uh, the parotid. And this is my overall data sheet. Uh, this was, let us see if the video plays here. This as you can see, uh, a patient with a parotoseal, this is an intra-op picture. You can see the parotoseal transilluminated. I will just hurry up this video. This is how, uh, I mean I have entered into a cavity. You can see a lot of pus cloud there. And you can see now the guide wire as compared to the uh, wideness of the cavity. It is 10 or 15 times wider than the cavity. This is another case of tongue tie fibrosis. Uh, what happened is this patient had a tongue tie release one year back and then he landed up with a left submandibular gland obstruction. Now, he was advised removal of the gland. Somehow he landed up with me. What I did was I tried to go in through the normal papilla. I could not go in. So, I dissected. Let us let us watch this. This is the trunk frenulum, this is the right, the probe into the right, uh, this thing, the dilator going into the right, the left was this picture, not convincing I was inside the lumen. So, I dissected the floor of the mouth, dissected the duct, entered the duct at this point, confirmed that I was inside the lumen, passed the guide wire, passed the stent over it and created a neopapilla by suturing the opening to the floor of the mouth. So, this is the neopapilla. So, one more gland functioning gland was saved. How much time do I have sir? How much time do I have? Time is over. Time is over? Okay. Uh, this is an interesting case. I will just show this and then we can conclude. Okay. This, this was the case reported as a stone and as a soft stone. And you can see this is an odd shaped stone and I removed it and uh, at the end of the procedure this turned out to be an anise seed which was covered with cal calcium, calcium deposits. Another interesting case reported as soft stone. This is the only case which I have come across in this cylindroscopy world. For the strange thing is soft stone, my radiologist said it is not as calcified as the normal stones. It does not have the post shadow effect. When I went in, uh, I could see some extensions to this foreign body, like some appendages. Can you see this? Two appendages to it. And then I used a three wire basket. to trap again this. Okay, so, I was using a three wire basket. I trapped the stone. I tried to get it out and suddenly I could see four wires. So, I thought maybe the basket has broken. But to my surprise, when we removed that whatever stone, soft stone was, it turned out to be an insect. That is the only documented case of an insect causing recurrent parotitis. Radioidine, as I said, um, causes a lot of damage. You have seen some normal uh, mucosa. Let us see if you can see after post radioidine 7 years, you can see the mucosa all echimotic, 
loss of vasculature, there was a stone inside that is the reason why we had to do sial endoscopy and then we removed the stone. Also another interesting case came to me with a CT scan done with this picture. When I did a sial endoscopy there was nothing in the ductal system. So, I was wondering what is happening these large stones you do not miss. Um, I went in through an internal combined approach for the parotid. I dissected out those stones. I did a scopy again there was no breach of the duct. But the stones appeared to be lighter than the normal stones. So, I just cut them open and uh, this was like immediately after that and this is a desiccated state. It turned out to be a phlebolith. So, I went back to the radiology books and I found out that if you have a radiolucent center to a stone in a KUB, they take it as a phlebolith and not as a ureteric calculus. So, if I had known that this would have been I mean that is why this is a learning if you see a radiolucent center to a stone it is not a stone it is a phlebolith. So, in conclusion I would say silendoscopy is a nearly non-invasive it is an organ preserving, function preserving, a modality for diagnosis as well as treatment and it has low morbidity and has its obvious cosmetic advantages. Now my gratitudes to my family members, Professor, Professor Francis Marshall who is I consider the father of style endoscopy. He has taught me everything that I have learned. And also as part of my life these are the activities that go on along with sial endoscopy and I will leave you with this. <laughs>